And hello to you, and welcome to the Richard Nichols Podcast, the personal development podcast series that's here to help inspire, educate, and motivate you to be the best you can be. I'm psychotherapist Richard Nichols, and this is episode 203. It's titled Emotional Intelligence. And if you're ready, we'll start the show. Hello, people. Welcome to a new month. If you're a listener to my premium content through Patreon or you're a, a, a paid subscriber on Apple Podcasts, you'd have heard me talking about developing empathy the other week as a way of helping us to control our emotions. Empathy is quite useful if you want to help change things like anger and resentment into understanding and acceptance, like finding better responses to someone who maybe cuts into your lane when driving. But sometimes, for whatever reason, people can feel too much emotion, even too much empathy, actually, so that if somebody tells you about a problem that they've got, you feel pain and discomfort instead of tenderness and concern. Or for a lot of folk, everything's just turned up a bit or turned up a lot. And if you could put a, a number on a, on a scale of 1 to 10 then something that really only deserves you to feel at sort of a 3 out of 10 pokes you up to 8 and it's overwhelming. It would be good to know how to handle those sorts of things. So, first off, let's get into the basics of emotions themselves because there's this common idea, often spoken about by psychologists and neurologists, that emotions themselves don't really exist. And I know that seems a bit strange, but I can understand why academics keep finding reasons to agree with it. Because it's not impossible that an emotional response is created by our brain just by making best guesses based on past experiences. It makes predictions. A bit like the fact that you know that the reason I make these episodes is to help inspire, educate and motivate you to be... That's all right. That's right. The best you can be. You knew that was coming next and your brain filled in the gap before I actually said it because it's predictable. If you've been listening for long enough anyway, the brain knew what was coming next and it was based not on present thought, but on past experience. That's why somebody with anxiety about exams will turn nervousness into panic, not because of what's happening right now, but because of what has happened before. Maybe because the very first time they experienced it, they didn't have the emotional intelligence to know what it was and just felt sick and scared. And then the next time the volume was turned up on it because it's the fear itself that's being feared. But your brain is trying to make sense of the sensations in your body and only has one place to go. Fear rather than determination. Because how would I know if I was feeling determined to do my best in, eg in an exam, to really turn up that determined feeling to the max, how would that feel? Well, it would probably be in my gut, it would be in my muscles, it would be in my heart rate. But if the only place my brain has got is to go to panic, then that's what it's going to feel like. If I called you a snotter person, I doubt you'd be very pleased with me. Imagine that. Imagine if I sent you a text message that said, I think you are a snotter human and I hope you get everything you deserve. I think you'd be a bit miffed. Unless, of course, you already knew that snotter is an old English word that means clever. In which case, I do think you're a snotter human and I do hope that you get everything that you deserve. One thing I was reminded of when I was reading through the studies into this was something that a theatre director said to me once. He'd brought in a, a speaker to a rehearsal and asked us all to sit in silence and see what sort of reactions the music was able to bring. And he played a few different tracks. And after each one, he'd ask us uh, to go around the group to see if any tracks in there meant something to any of us. And the music was completely random, you know, but it was just things like the theme to Jurassic Park and Dancing Queen by ABBA. I can't remember any of the others, but I remember those two. Because a friend of mine said that the theme to Jurassic Park was quite an emotional piece to him. It sparked off memories that had emotions attached to them. And it was me that put my hand up in the air for Dancing Queen because literally two weeks previously, 
I'd seen an obituary in the local paper for a 17-year-old girl that had been killed in a car accident. And her parents put those lyrics into the obituary. You are the dancing queen, young and sweet, only 17, and blimey. I don't even know who this girl is. And reading it in the Nuneaton Times didn't really poke my tear ducts at the time. But hearing those lyrics two weeks later, and genuinely talking about it now, all these years later, and I haven't spoken about this for a while, actually. I mentioned this a couple of years ago on a patron-only podcast, and, and tears sprang to my eyes then, and it's just done it again now. Yet it's just a cheesy 70s song that you'll hear at every flipping wedding reception. Yet I was able to use that in a play to help me act out the part of a grieving man at a graveside. And my son was about three at the time, and it probably helped, because my brain was able to make the connections from Dancing Queen to the loss of a child quite easily. Yet I don't have an overactive empathy process, fortunately. Things clients say to me obviously create a reaction in me, of course. Tears spring to my eyes in the consulting room quite often. I have to blink them away. We might be therapists, but we're not robots. So let's say that emotions, in and of themselves, don't actually exist. If that's the case, it can give us permission to challenge the feelings that we experience sometimes, so as to bring things down a notch or two. So there are a couple of approaches to this. And like I always say, there are no rules as such to almost anything in psychology. There are no rules. It's not a science as such. It's more, well, is it a science? Oh, I'm not getting into that debate. Is it an art or is it a science? Because it's the brain. It's squishy. <laughs> it's difficult to follow rules. You just do what works for you. But the approaches are either to accept the feelings without judgment so so as to acknowledge how you feel at the time to make it easier to let it go or to distract from the feeling so as to ignore it and dilute it down with alternative feelings in all honesty usually it's a bit of both and i think starting with accepting how you feel give it a label understand it and you've got your foot in the door to trying to control it there's a big difference between feeling angry and feeling disappointed. But anger can mask vulnerability and and guilt. We can't do anything with anger if the reason for the emotion is actually something else. So acknowledge what it actually is that you're experiencing, even if you're feeling somebody else's pain. Then what you're feeling is compassion there, not grief, for example. It helps you to reframe your emotion and then reframe the situation. Because if we put a different frame around an experience, it's going to completely change how you feel. If your thoughts are very often negative, then seeing a missed call from somebody, it's likely to remind you about the possibility of bad news. So your brain jumps onto the worst case scenario. You know, why did they call? What's just happened? When nothing's happened, they just wanted to tell you that they've finished the book that they borrowed from you and they're going to pop it around later. If an email from your boss saying, please, can you come in and see me when you're next in the office, by default means something interesting and exciting might be going on, rather than, oh my God, I'm going to be sacked, aren't I? Then you can change fear into excitement. I've said this before, and it certainly bears repeating. Fear and excitement are pretty much the same thing. They feel the same. It's just the frame that we put around it is different. Two people queuing up next to each other for a roller coaster ride could feel exactly the same as each other. Yet one's excited because they feel that something good is going to happen, and the other one feels terrified because they feel that something bad is going to happen. Well, you can't feel anything that's about to happen. That's not how feelings work. Feelings don't predict the future. We can get a feeling that something's wrong, and we might not consciously know what it is, but our instincts, because of repetition, do. Before we were hunter-gatherers, we were just gatherers. Before we learned to make tools, all we did was hide from other animals and tigers and things, and we just ate berries all day. We were the hunted and were scavengers. That at a push, we might have ate seafood that we caught, but any meat was mostly carrion left by bigger animals. So it's in our nature to be quite vulnerable and on edge. And if something in our environment is different... Even if we haven't consciously spotted it yet, our instincts often will try to make us anxious, just in case what's different is a tiger in the grass. The modern equivalent might be that 
<sighs> I've took an ornament off a shelf to dust it and I've put it back in the wrong place and it annoys my wife. Or you're driving to work and you find that there's a road closure that day and you've got to take a detour. And although there are diversion signs showing exactly where you've got to go to get you back on track, the roads are unfamiliar. You're lost. You don't know where you are. But you consciously trust the fact that the council have put the signs up properly. And even though it feels like a different direction, you're still going the right way. Well, the eerie feeling you get during, I remember this not so long ago, there was a partial solar eclipse. Because even though it's 11 o'clock in the morning, the amount of light reminds you of 7 o'clock at night. But the angle of the shadows is wrong. That's a weird one, I know. But that's happened a few times to me, actually. And the frame I put around it, is going to be interest and curiosity rather than spookiness and fear and anxiety. But if you can look at things differently, then you will feel differently about those things. And then you can distract yourself. Then you can do something different with your thoughts and with your body. Much as smartphones can be a problem with mental health, we can also use them to our advantage too. You can have a thousand photos on there that you just flick through. Specific photos that you've put on there for those times when you feel anxious, possibly. Parties you've gone to, friends, family, experiences, they can be a great distraction. And if you put them on there in advance, rather than using social media as a, as a distraction, you can change the channel in your brain with them. Maybe you need to then simply stand up, go and get a drink of water, go for a wee, stretch, do some breathing exercises, whatever you need to do, you might just need a slight distraction. And changing your situation slightly can then make it easier to change your thinking, which makes it easier to change your emotional state, especially with those deep diaphragmatic breathing exercises that I I speak about quite often, at least I think I do. Now, I haven't talked about it on this podcast for a little while. I certainly do in the consulting room. I'm always talking about... Uh, deep breathing exercises so i'm sure i do on here as well if you've ignored me saying that in the past then watch the video that's on the freebies page on my website or on my youtube channel where i go into it and what else would there be a distraction listen to some music music that reminds you of happy things think about people that remind you of happy things and don't underestimate mental relaxation exercises There's a reason why my very first training course was a hypnotherapy one, but even though I became a psychotherapist, eventually I still work with guided imagery because it really does help. By practising slowing down your thoughts, you strengthen the ability to control them and to regulate your emotions. So please do. There are some freebies, some free ones on my website. If you sign up for my weekly newsletter, the auto-reply sends you a link to them. And if you want any extra then do consider supporting the podcast on patreon.com where there are loads more to listen to. I'm not naive enough to think that that's all you need to do, of course. Managing your emotions is not that easy. And there is going to be some emotions like anger that sometimes gets the better of you. But the more time and attention that you spend on regulating your emotions, the mentally stronger you're going to get. You'll gain confidence in your ability to handle them whilst at the same time knowing that you can make better choices that shift your mood to a more appropriate one it just takes practice like i say if you want more episodes or you just want to help support the show you can become a patron on patreon.com not only does that help to keep the podcast series going because i really don't like the idea of sponsorship but also some of your pledge goes to various charitable things as well it funds therapy for people who are struggling financially there are food banks that we work with hospices and all sorts of things i mean i'm no marcus rashford but we can all do our bit can't we and if if only a tenth of the listeners to the public feed also became five pound a month patrons I'd never need to charge any of my clients for therapy. We could help so many people. Anyway, that, that's not ultimately my goal anyway. I'm not a salesman. But if you do like what I do and you'd like to contribute, you can do that through Patreon. But you don't have to. Your life is your own. So go and enjoy it, whatever you do. I'll be back soon enough. Have a super couple of weeks, pod fans. See you.